we started talking with this one. Hi, everyone. I'm Mandy Cohen. I'm the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services for North Carolina, and I'm joined by Director of Emergency Management Mike Sprayberry, Brian Tipton, and Karen Magoon are our sign language interpreters. And working behind the scenes are our Spanish translators, Jackie and Jasmine Metevier. I'll start with a rundown of the numbers. As of this morning, there were 20,860 laboratory confirmed cases, 578 people are currently hospitalized, and sadly, we are now at 716 deaths. Since yesterday, there were 738 new COVID-19 positive cases. This is another high number of cases over one day and underscores the need to move cautiously as we ease restrictions. As we prepare to enter phase two just tomorrow, there have been several questions on the use of face coverings. The executive order does not require North Carolinians to wear face coverings outside the home. However, it is strongly, strongly recommended. Remember, people can have COVID-19 and not have any symptoms. Face coverings protect your loved ones and your neighbors. The executive order does, however, require employees of personal care, grooming, and tattoo businesses to wear face coverings. We are also strongly recommending customers also wear face coverings while in the business. As a reminder, while this order lifts the governor's stay at home order, we are moving to a safer at home recommendation. High risk individuals are still encouraged to stay home. Just over half of adults in North Carolina are at higher risk for severe illness from COVID-19 because they are 65 or older or they have at least one of the underlying health conditions or both, so half of North Carolinians. Today, North Carolina is also reporting its first case of what's called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MISC. It's associated with COVID-19. MISC is a very rare but serious inflammatory disease found in some children who have current or recent infections. While children generally experience mild symptoms from COVID-19, recently a possible link has been found between COVID-19 and MISC. We've asked our physicians around North Carolina to be on the lookout for MSIC and report suspected cases for further investigation. While I'm not able to share more information about this specific child, I can report they are now home and doing well. There's addition, additional information about MISE posted now on our website. And before I end, just one last reminder that we can continue to help slow the spread of the virus by remembering the three W's, wear, wait, wash, wear a cloth face covering, wait six feet apart, and wash your hands often or use hand sanitizer. Please continue to take care of yourself and those around you. Stay well. Thank you so much. And now I will turn it over to Director Mike Sprayberry for his remarks. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and good afternoon, everybody. I want to start again today with an update on severe weather that has impacted our state. Heavy rains have caused flooding in the last few days in some of our western counties. Sadly, the severe weather has led to one death in Surrey County where a tree fell on a home. There have been landslides that have washed out some roads in Polk County. Rutherford County is cleaning up from downed trees and flooded roads. McDowell County has evacuated two campgrounds and is sheltering evacuees in a local hotel. Portions of NC-12 in Dare, US-64 and US-74 in Rutherford and US-52 in Stanley County are partially closed due to flooding or debris. Multiple secondary roads, particularly in western North Carolina, have portions closed due to flooding. We continue to have pockets of power outages in impacted counties and remain in close contact with our local partners to be able to support any resource needs or address any limiting factors as they continue to respond in their communities and we thank them for that. As rains continue today, we may see more flooding, and I must stress the importance 
of not driving through moving water across a flooded road. If you can't see the road, you don't know if it's there beneath the water. The National Weather Service has issued a flash flood watch for most of North Carolina. With periods of heavy rainfall, flood warnings and advisories are in effect for many areas along the rivers across the state through the weekend. All rivers in the west will see rises, but the Catawba River is most at risk for flooding in the mountains. Minor flooding is also possible for central North Carolina through late this evening. While some rivers will begin to recede late this week, river flooding may linger through the weekend in some locations. Everyone, especially those living along rivers and streams, should be alert to the possibility of flooding and landslides and should have a way to receive weather alerts, like a NOAA weather radio or a weather app on your smartphone. You can also monitor river and stream levels and get flood alerts from Feynman, our flood and inundation mapping and alert network. The website is Feynman.nc.gov. That's F I. MAN.NC.gov. With the holiday weekend approaching and as we move into phase two of reopening, many people will be tempted to engage in water activities such as boating and swimming as well as other recreational activities. Remember that fast moving water in our streams and rivers can be dangerous and people should exercise caution and wear a U.S. Coast Guard approved life jacket. For those planning to go to the beach, Powerful surf and dangerous rip currents are expected to continue for eastern North Carolina, as well as minor soundside flooding, so please use caution. And remember to continue practicing social distancing even when doing these activities. Today is day 73 of the State Emergency Operations Center's COVID-19 response. We're continuing to distribute personal protective gear to long-term care facilities across the state. Long-term care homes picked up supplies in Greensboro for a second day yesterday, and today this operation is moved to Mecklenburg County for two days of pickups. More than 3,500 licensed long-term care homes across the state are receiving a two-week supply of protective equipment during these events. We thank our partners with the Office of Emergency Medical Services, other DHHS partners, the National Guard, and our state and local emergency managers for their support on these distribution events. From our warehouses, teams delivered supplies to 34 counties and three health care preparedness coalitions yesterday. Shipments included isolation gowns, gloves, face shields, multiple types of masks, goggles, coveralls, shoe covers, antibacterial soap, hand sanitizer, thermometers, and other needed items. In the last two days, we've received more than 58,000 gowns, 29,000 face shields, 17,000 filters, and close to 100,000 masks, including procedural masks, N95 masks, and KN95 masks. School nutrition sites in all 115 school districts have provided 23 million meals since schools closed on March the 16th. There are currently 1,000 pickup drive through meal sites and 2,100 school buses delivering meals around the state. We continue to work to support school feeding sites however possible. The National Guard are assisting local school district in these efforts and the Department of Public Instruction is continuing to work with school nutrition directors to identify and resolve potential gaps for feeding through the summer months. These feeding sites have made a tremendous difference in fighting food insecurity in our state, and we're extremely grateful for their continued work. Remember to observe the three W's. Wear a cloth face covering, wait at least six feet apart, and wash your hands often. That's wear, wait, and wash. And as always, don't forget to look out for your family, friends, and neighbors, and to call your loved ones daily. Guaranteed they'll appreciate it. With kindness and cooperation, we will all get through this together as one team, one mission, and one family. Thank you so much. Madam Secretary, turn it back over to you for questions and answers. Terrific. Thank you, Director Sprayberry, and we'll open for questions. 
We'll take our first question today from Steve Devaney at the Fayetteville Observer. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, this question is for um, Secretary Cohen. I know that your office put out um, uh, some information, some updated guidance for long-term care facilities, and that there is, as Director Strayberry uh, said, the uh, additional PPE that's going to them. And uh, but I was wondering if if my addition is correct, like more than half of the deaths have occurred in these type facilities. So is it a continued concern regard, uh, since there are, have been so many outbreaks? And uh, what are you saying to them as far as the way that they can, uh, any additional ways that they could protect their residents and their staff? Thank you. Steve, thanks much for the question. And yes, it is an ongoing concern related to our long-term care settings. We knew that this would be um, an issue as we looked at other countries and states before us. I think we knew in Washington state the first uh, uh, viral spread we saw was in a long-term care facility. So the concern remains, which is why as we're easing restrictions into phase two, you will see that we have continued to keep in place all of the requirements and guidance that we had for long-term care facilities that we've had for quite a number of weeks limiting visitation, um, requiring uh, protective uh, face covering for uh, all of the workers who are in the, our long-term care settings. Um, obviously, that is why we did the push of protective equipment to them to make sure that they had what they need. Um, and, and many other kinds of guidance, like making sure that they are isolating folks who, who do have COVID-19 away from those who, who don't, um, to make sure that the staff who is caring for those with COVID-19 is not mixing into those who don't. So there's quite a number of guidance. We also recognize that this is a financial uh, and resource con concern for those delivering care in long-term care settings. This is more, more work, and we want them to do that proactive and preventive work, which is why through our Medicaid program, We've also done additional rate increases for them to be able to meet these new uh, requirements and do this work to protect folks. Um, and then lastly is testing and making sure that we are doing testing um, in a way that uh, we, we can identify the virus early and then react. Um, so we have already said for a number of weeks that if you have at least one case, not even just two, which is technically the outbreak, uh, a single case that we want to be testing everyone in that facility, staff and residents. And I know my team is now working with the association to understand how can we go about periodic proactive testing of uh, both the residents and the staff to even get further um, along here. Work is still in progress there to get to that level of testing, um, but that is the, the, the work ahead of us. The federal government put out additional guidance that sort of codified some of this, including expectations about doing more testing. So that's um, where we'll, we'll head, um, and we continue to have it be an area of focus um, for us. We obviously know that the folks in these settings are already medically frail. Um, they tend to be older um, already with, with um, medical conditions, so it puts them at some of the highest risk uh, when we're understanding COVID-19. Thank you. Our next question is from Savannah Levins with WCNC TV. Hi there. This question is for uh, Secretary Cohen. My understanding of MISC is that uh, the symptoms really present up to four weeks after exposure to COVID-19. Because of that, is there a concern that we will see a spike in MIC cases? Uh, even as COVID-19 numbers might decrease in the state? And is that something that you think the state's prepared for? Thanks for that question. I do want to reiterate that the multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome in children, MISC, is something that is very, very rare. Um, so that, that, but it is something notable because it is severe. Um, and we are asking doctors um, and our hospitals to be on the lookout for that. Um, we have found our first case here. And as we see more infection, yes, because there's an association with COVID-19 and this multi-systemic uh, inflammatory syndrome, we do expect as you see more disease, you may see more of this. But I, I want to make sure parents know um, that this is a very rare, 
but we want to be on the lookout for it just the same. I know that we have the capacity to be able to handle this within our, our healthcare system. I know our pediatricians are on the lookout for this at, at our hospitals. Um, the one child here is, is luckily home and, and doing well. Um, so folks do recover from this, but it is something to definitely be aware of. We are tracking it and have our first case here in North Carolina. Our next question is from Matt Mercer with the North State Journal. Hey, good afternoon, uh, Secretary Cohen. Uh, two questions. Uh, first, there was a provision in the COVID-19 relief bill passed um, that listed, I believe, five different um, metrics or data points needed to release the $25 million uh, from the CARES Act. So I want to know if the new data on the health and the, the VHHS website has been updated to reflect that, to receive that money. And then secondly, um, Matt, oh, did I lose you for the second one? We can come back to the second one. Let me do the the data and metrics. So yes, as part of the General Assembly's allocation of federal funds, uh, they allocated some money around testing. They asked for some additional metrics um, for us to be putting together. Those are metrics that we need to compile from other other places, right? We need the, that information to come from hospitals and labs and others. So we are working with our stakeholders to make sure that information can come to us, that we can assemble it, and then uh, make sure that it's available for folks. Obviously, we want to be using uh, that that money. We want to be ramping up testing. So we, yes, we are working hard to make sure that we can get accurate information, respond to those those requests uh, that the General Assembly made. We aren't able to do that yet. As I said, this is not our data, but rather data that other parties have that we will aggregate, put together, make sure is accurate, and then post uh, for the public as we have been doing. Um, and we are working to do that in order to use that money. Thank you. Matt, if you have a follow-up, I'm happy to do that. Sorry, might have lost you. Did we lose everybody? <laughs> Our next question is from Jim Morrill with the Charlotte Observer. Jim Morrill. Hi, Jim. Uh, hey, hey, Secretary, thank you. Um, as you probably know, uh, Secretary Azar is in Charlotte today. And how would you characterize the federal government's assistance to North Carolina during the pandemic, especially in terms of testing kids, PPEs, tracing, and that kind of support? Well, thanks for that question, Jim. Yes, we were aware that Secretary Azar was visiting the Charlotte area. I believe he went to Atrium, one of our community health centers there. Um, and I know that they've, they're they talking to them both about the uh, help that we've got from the federal government, but the challenges that remain here in North Carolina. I know folks are articulating both the need for federal support to our state and local governments, but also the need for federal support for our providers. Um, we know that there was a, a, a large provider relief fund and that Ooh. Okay. Can folks still hear me? Okay. I'll try that again. So I I know that um, that there is a provider relief fund and some of that funds have been distributed, but we want to see continued support of our health care infrastructure here in North Carolina. So that's very important. As far as PPE, look, that's been a long tread road. That's been a challenge all along. Um, we have needed to go outside of the federal uh, 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 lines of getting supplies, and we have procured our own uh, PPE, as many, many states have done. On the testing supply, similar, is that the uh, uh, federal government has said that they're going to be giving us some, um, some testing supplies. I think about 20% of those supplies have come in so far, and so we have done our own procurement procurement outside of that to make sure that we have the supplies we need. So yes, more always needed from the federal government in terms of supplies. But I, I really think the primary thing that, that I think at this point we are hoping from the federal government continues to be the funding uh, piece for state and local government, for our providers, but also continued funding support for testing. Um, not just the supplies, but paying for the test itself and thinking about paying for that on an ongoing basis. Um, we want to make sure that we, you know, if this is a sustained effort in fighting COVID-19, that we have the funding to be able to continue to respond um, and fight COVID-19. So 
Thanks, Jim. I'm looking forward to hearing how that, the, the visit went with Secretary Azar. Next question is from Richard Craver with the Winston-Salem Journal. Yes, uh, Secretary Cohen, this is Richard Craver with the Winston-Salem Journal. Uh, I had a couple of questions for you. One, uh, you probably are aware we continue to have a significant increase in cases in Forsyth County. We had another 48 today. We're um, Forsyth over 800 now. And I was wanting to see if you've been able to determine if there's anything specific besides just increases in cases and clusters that may be contributing to that sharp increase over the last week or so. And then the second question, uh, also you probably saw the report about Tyson Foods saying they had 570 um, confirmed infected employees in Wilkesboro. And I was wanting to see what y'all are looking to do in terms of trying to help with those kind of outbreaks at, at these kind of meat packing plants or even in large employers. And if y'all are prepared to try to put out data along those plants like you have with the nursing homes and the residential care facilities. Well, thanks, Richard. First, let me talk about Forsyth County and the increased cases. Yes, we are watching all of those numbers very closely. We're seeing an increase in two of our more urban centers in North Carolina, Charlotte, uh, Mecklenburg area, and then the, the triad in Forsyth County. Um, right now, right, we, we just know that those are where more people are densely located. And so I think we know in those areas you bump into people more often, and we know as we ease restrictions, folks are, are moving around more, which means the virus is going to move around more. That's why we need to really be sure to be cautious as we are moving into phase two. We've been watching our numbers really closely, and we went through those in detail yesterday, and they're not perfect. Um, and we, they're overall stable, but they, they show us a, a sign of caution here, um, which is why the step forward in phase two was more modest than we had originally uh, thought. I think today's case count being another high number also right adds to that concern. And I think that you are, are um, your, your second part of your question related to Tyson Foods is, is yes, we are seeing some of these cases come from some of our critical infrastructure businesses where by the nature of, of that business, they, they it's harder to distance uh, at, at their job. The president has already said we need to keep those uh, uh, food processing plants open as critical infrastructure businesses. I think, as you also know, these pr meat processing plants are regulated and very heavily regulated by the Department of Agriculture. What our role is from the Department of Public Health is to help them um, on the infection control, just as you mentioned, Richard. Um, and that's what we've been doing all along in a, l a number of meat processing plants across the state. Um, when, when something like this comes to our attention, and again, they are not required to report, but when it does come to our attention and they seek our help, which many have, we're, we're glad to offer it, um, whether it's to go on site um, or to help over the phone, to help them with the various infection control measures whether that's making sure everyone has a mask, using plexiglass to do some barriers, whether it's slowing down the line, doing the deep cleaning. So there's a lot of things that we can go through. There's a toolkit on our, our website on, on best practices. Um, so those are the kinds of things we're, we're doing. We're also helping to facilitate on-site or close to the plant site testing so that they can do that um, amount of testing. So Tyson was a good example of that, is that they wanted to make sure that folks got tested and, and worked with both the local public health department and, and the, the state to make sure that that could happen. So that's how we are, are, are working uh, together. And in terms of, of, of posting the data, again, these are not an industry that is required to report or is regulated by our department. We have been posting uh, uh, information information about uh, positive cases by zip code level, um, and that gives a lot of information in terms of, of knowing, particularly in some of these rural areas, what, what's happening. Um, we are required to report certain other kinds of settings, like the congregate living settings, so that's why you see those um, show up on our, our website the way they do. All right, thanks so much for the question. Our next question is from Tyler Harden with WCTI News Channel 12. Good afternoon, Secretary Cohen. This is Tyler Harden from News Channel 12. Thank you for taking my question. A lot of fitness centers and personal training studios here in the East were anticipating the opportunity to open in phase two of this Friday. Owners say that they all have the procedures set up to properly social distance and sanitize between clients. 
please explain why you all did not allow these facilities to open under those strict guidelines and how long you anticipate they'll have to keep their doors closed. Thank you. Tyler, thank you, and I I appreciate that we've had to take a more modest step here in our phase two, and so gyms and fitness centers were not included in that group. As you think about gyms, I think they have two risk factors that make them challenging. Um, I think we know all of the activities we're moving forward with now are higher risk, and I do want to note that for folks. Anytime we're talking about an indoor activity where you're either sitting down or in closer proximity, those are places where uh, you're going to have more viral spread. But as we look at gyms specifically, um, that is when you know that as you, you work out, you obviously breathe more heavily and more intensely. And this is a viral respiratory pathogen, right? So it is something that is expelled through your droplets of your mouth and your nose, which obviously come out with more force and can be in more distance when you are working out. Um, and so some had said, is it because of the sweat? It's not, it's not an issue related to sweat. It is really more about the heavy, heavier breathing that you do naturally when you are, are doing any of the athletics in a, in a gym set setting. Um, But it's also knowing that when you are working out, folks are not going to be wearing a mask covering in order to get good um, ability to breathe in deeply, again, because you're you're working out. So the combination of of not wearing the the face mask and uh, the face coverings and having more respiratory droplets um, expelled because you're working out does put that at a higher risk. Now, that's not to say we can never move there and it's too risky ever. I think this is just about taking a measured approach so that we are going to do some of these other activities because what we're seeing is we, we have virus here in our community. We have it at, at um, higher day-over-day new case rates. Um, as, as Richard mentioned in his last question, seeing Forsyth, for example, with higher increases, Mecklenburg area, higher increases, Wilkes County, others, um, we want to make sure we understand how the virus is spreading around North Carolina, what are our triggers and hot spots uh, here in North Carolina that may be different than other states, and how do we need to continue to move forward. So we wanted to take this modest step forward with phase two. Jim's was not a part of it. Uh, have, we have been working with um, the associations that represent Jim's to try to get together the guidance so that when we are able to move forward, they, they know what are the, those parameters that they would need to put in place in order to move forward. Um, and so you know, we'll take this modest step. We'll keep looking at our data and keep looking at our numbers and we'll continue to uh, report those publicly and come back uh, to this and hopefully continue to make progress. Our next question is from Nick Henderson with the Carolina Journal. Uh, hi, Dr. Cohen. Thank you very much for taking my question. Uh, I have a question about outdoor dining as defined in phase two. There are limits, of course, uh, as far as social distancing and table distancing are concerned for uh, outdoor dining at uh, restaurants and the like. I just wondered if there was any sort of additional uh, information that could be available about restaurants that wanted to add dining space, if they could do so perhaps at a parking lot or at uh, at a patio or something like that, as as is happening in other states. I just wondered if uh, that was something that uh, that was being considered, because apparently there is some confusion among some restaurant owners about whether they could do that or not. Rick, thanks for the question, and I don't know that answer. I'd, let me take that back to our team to understand uh, the parameters here. So we'll take that back. I appreciate the the feedback, and we'll be sure to be in touch with the Restaurant Association. I know that we work collaboratively to put the guidelines uh, together uh, with them. So let me take this back to um, our, our experts that work closely on this, and we will we'll let you know. Take our last question today from Joe Bruno at WSOC TV, Charlotte. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Cohen, it's Joe Bruno from Channel 9. Why is it a restaurant can reopen their indoor dining, but a brewery or cocktail bar can't? Why not just make the breweries and cocktail bars follow the same rules as restaurants? Face out the table, limit capacity, no bands or dancing, things along that nature. Joe, thanks for that. And so we know that all of these activities that we were contemplating for a phase two now constitute activities that are higher risk, right? Where they're indoors, they're, they're places where people sit down, um, and we know there are opportunities for more virus spread. 
And so as we looked at our metrics, right, the indicators that were trying to tell us how are we doing as a state, should we move forward, what, it, what we said is largely they are stable. However, there were some early warning signs to, to tell us, you know what, we need to take a modest step here. And so we did pull back from all of uh, the original uh, businesses that we contemplated. Um, so we are moving forward with restaurants at 50% capacity uh, to salon and other personal care services to pools and such, day, ca uh, day camp, overnight camp. Um, so we, we recognize that that means um, there, there are some businesses we didn't want to move forward with at this time, right? Because like I said, all of these activities have, have risks. And the question is, should we be doing them all at the same time? And the data really indicated to us that we need to take a modest step and continue to go, go slow. It's not an on-off switch, unfortunately. We really have to think about this as a dimmer switch and bring things up slowly. What I want to see is how our state does with this new opening. I think folks will go out and enjoy their favorite restaurants um, as, as they go go forward here, they'll go back and they'll get their haircuts. And, um, and so let's see how we do um, with this. And then we'll continue to reassess, continue to look at those numbers, um, and then continue, I hope, to make progress. I think the things that will help us make the most progress, if you're thinking, gosh, how do I help get those additional businesses um, open? How do we keep the virus uh, level low? It starts with this. It starts with wearing a face covering. Um, and so that, that is something we are struggling strongly urging anyone, if you're leaving the house, when you pick up your keys, uh, pick up your face covering, make sure you have, a, you know, throw some in your car so you have them. Um, so face coverings one, but it can't be in isolation. Got to do it with also washing your hands as well as waiting six feet apart. If we do all of those things and we all do this together, right, that's what's going to get us, us through here. That's going to allow us to live with this virus because we know it's here with us in North Carolina. And the question is how can we safely return to all the activities that we love, whether it's at a brewery or or a restaurant, how do we do that um, in, in a way that will allow us to live with the virus and still protect the most vulnerable among us? Even if we are not personally vulnerable, the fact that we could transmit the virus without knowing it makes us a risk to those who are vulnerable. And we know that half of North Carolinians fall in that category of either being over 65 or having a chronic disease risk factor. So let's take care of each other. We'll do our three W's. Um, and I'm hoping everyone will uh, you know, embrace that as we move forward into phase two and beyond. All right, Joe, thanks for the question. And thanks everyone for tuning in today. I'm sure we'll be back uh, tomorrow.